Hi, hope you're enjoying the conference so far. I uh, wish I could be there with you in person, but this is the next best thing. And I'm excited to talk to you today about accessibility and coats of arms. So if you're someone who likes to follow along with slides while the talk is going, I did tweet them out. Um, so you can go and look me up on Twitter if you want to access those. Uh, the inspiration for this talk is basically in software design and development, uh, often we deal with complex problems and lessons that can feel kind of novel and new at first. Um, but a lot of times these are problems that people have wrestled with in some capacity for years or even centuries. Uh, so I thought it would be interesting to take a look at design, um, specifically accessibility, within the historical lens of coats of arms. So to give you an idea of where we're headed, um, I'll open by giving you some historical context about coats of arms and what they're for and where they come from. Uh, for the meat of this talk, we'll look at the lessons that we can learn from the design of coats of arms, and then we'll talk about how to apply those lessons to our work in software. So uh, a popular place that you might have seen coats of arms recently uh, is in Game of Thrones. So if you're a fan of the series, you might recognize some of the symbols like the Stark's dire wolf or in the middle you have the Lannister lion. Uh, and these are symbols or emblems that had special meaning to those houses and were used to identify people who belong to one of those houses. Accessibility is kind of a big word and especially in the last two to five years, it's been kind of a buzzword. Uh, the, this talk is not meant to be an introduction to accessibility. Um, there are college courses and degrees and certificates on that subject, but uh, just to kind of look at best practices of accessibility within a different historical lens. And hopefully you'll learn some interesting things and kind of gain a new perspective. So as you probably know, accessibility is about more than just uh, what something looks like. So more than just kind of using good contrast and having a readable font. Uh, it means designing for people with motor impairments by providing uh, keyboard accessible functions for everything that you expect a user to do. Uh, it means accommodating screen readers for your website, things like that. Um, so again, this is not intended to be a comprehensive introduction to accessibility, but I did pull the top 10 rules on accessibility practices from the Guide to the Internet for the EU. Uh, and those are, you don't worry about memorizing these or anything, I just want to review them quickly. Um, number one, structure contents. Avoid dependence on any one single sense, eyesight in particular. Help your users avoid mistakes, and if they make a mistake, show them how to correct it. Avoid any unexpected behaviors like flashing. Try and provide text descriptions where possible. Uh, make all of the functions on your site or app keyboard accessible. Uh, avoid rushing your users. Identify links and where they will take you. Uh, keep navigation UI consistent and try and keep your experience compatible across devices and browsers. Um, so I boiled those down even more into just three big rules, which are structure contents, uh, avoid dependence in any single sense, and avoid rushing your users or pigeonholing them into any one action. Uh, so if you hear the term coats of arms, you might picture something that looks like this. Uh, that's not what it is. Uh, the term comes from if I were getting ready for battle and I were to put on my suit of armor, then I would usually put on an armorial coat over that, which would have a coat of arms or essentially a crest printed onto it. So the purpose of a coat of arms is to be easily identifiable for the house or country it represents. And there are several reasons why that's good. Um, it enables you to record and embellish the history of your nation in kind of a visual format. Uh, it was a way to identify the dead so that you could look at their coat and see what house they belong to. It was a way to declare military units so that if I were traveling and saw a group of people, I could figure out if they were friendly to my house based on their banner or what they were wearing. It was a means of establishing pedigree if you could trace back your coat several generations. And it was a way to pass down family honors or symbols. So I'm going to use the term heraldry. Heraldry is defined as the system by which coats of arms and other armorial bearings are devised, described, and regulated. So it's kind of the overarching concept. 
I'm also going to use the terms emblem and seal interchangeably with coat of arms. Uh, they're considered subsets of coats of arms. So if I show you something that looks more like a seal for a letter, uh, it's also considered a coat of arms. I wanted to touch on rights of use for coats of arms because I think it's kind of interesting. Um, so I pulled some facts from some of the different countries that are researched while I was preparing for this talk. Uh, in Denmark, any unlawful use of heraldic arms is a criminal offense. Um, so if I'm using a coat of arms that I don't have the rights to, I could technically be charged criminally. In Italy, heraldic matters were ruled outside the scope of official law. And uh, similarly in South Africa, they said that all citizens can wear arms as they please. Um, so kind of a more flexible approach there. Uh, in Scotland, coats of arms are considered heritable property. Um, so might inherit the family farm and then also the family coat of arms. And in Ireland, uh, if you can trace back your ancestry, you can be granted the rights to a coat of arms. Uh, so I came up with a basic timeline for some key events in different regions surrounding this concept. Uh, so the earliest reference that we have to coats of arms in general is in 2000 BC, an uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics and artwork, they showed rulers who wore particular emblems to signify where they came from. Uh, in the first century, in the Bible, in the book of Numbers, it references insignias of the children of Israel, which is also considered a predecessor to this concept. Uh, in the 12th century, heraldic designs were in use by Western nobility. Uh, by the 16th century, they were strictly regulated in Ireland. And uh, by the 17th through 19th centuries, they were widely used to record family history. So some interesting events there. Great, so now let's see what they look like. Um, so I tried to pull a decent sample size of different kinds of designs. Obviously, it's not totally comprehensive. Uh, and I'm going to start with what you're probably familiar with if you've seen crests in a tourist shop or something like that. Uh, they were probably from Scotland or Ireland. Uh, so often the ones that people are familiar with are from Europe. And uh, particularly in this top row, you can see some design commonalities um, with the two figures on either side and the shield in the forefront and then um, some type of crown symbol and maybe a motto as well. So you can see certain similarities in a lot of those. Uh, Asian heraldry, uh, the ones for China and South Korea look more like seals in this case. They're kind of more round and bold. Um, the one representing the Russian Empire, can, you can see the Western influence. It's got kind of some similarities to some of the ones that we saw in the previous slide. And I'll also point out uh, Japan in the bottom row, those are pictures of kamon, which are emblems that were used to represent houses. And we'll talk more about those later. African heraldry, you can also see some Western influence, um, potentially as a result of colonialism, in particular for Nigeria, Malawi, Kenya, and Somalia with the two supporters on either side and the central shield. Uh, and then in the bottom right, you can see the coat of arms for Sudan has an eagle featured prominently, which is a common trend for coats of arms from the Middle East. So these are uh, what some of the different heraldic signs look like in the Middle East. And as you can see, many of them feature this eagle, which is called the Eagle of Saladin, and some kind of motto on the bottom. So it's kind of interesting to see uh, certain patterns within various regions when it comes to their coats of arms. Uh, these are some of the symbols from the Americas. These ones tend to, they, I think they all have some kind of greenery, which is kind of interesting. Uh, they also tend to be a little bit taller than the others, which I also found to be interesting, um, and maybe a little bit more color as well. Great, so again, that's not obviously all of the coats of arms there are, but it's a sampling. Um, so if we were to think about what makes a good coat of arms, if we were to create our own, uh, we would want it to be easily identifiable, potentially across a battlefield to our enemies. Uh, we might want to incorporate symbols that had special meaning to us uh, or things that will look impressive to someone else. So those are some things to keep in mind as we keep going. Uh, so this is, again, some of the samples that I showed you. And you can see there's a lot of variety. Some of them are extremely detailed, like this one from Haiti, which has a lot of minute details. Uh, and some of them are more bold, like this one from China, which is an emblem that really kind of pops out at you from among the rest. So let's talk about some of the things that are done well uh, in a lens of modern standards of accessibility. 
And again, there's no right and wrong because these are works of art. We're just choosing to look at them within this particular framework. Uh, so generally, these are pretty easily distinguishable. Um, so these are some heraldic symbols from Germany. And there are some similarities, like the use of the crown or the lion in some of them. But if two of them were side by side, I probably would be able to tell them apart pretty easily, which is good. There's generally good color contrast. Uh, this example is from Egypt, and it's got an object in the forefront against a lighter background, and then it's got the red lining. Uh, and I will point out that if you had red-green color blindness, this wouldn't be ideal, um, but it does have some good contrast. There's evidence of clear themes specifically within regions for a lot of these. Um, and a good example is the Japanese kimon. Um, so one example, you can see that there's a blossom in a lot of these symbols, and that symbolizes the renewal of life. Often they're pretty recognizable, even if someone came from a different background. Um, so in particular, there's one here that has a sword, which is pretty easy to interpret. Uh, if you have an animal with bared teeth, um, that's also probably pretty understandable. Um, so it's not a blanket rule, but in general, they have recognizable elements for people who come from different backgrounds. So what are some things that could have been done better according to modern standards of accessibility? Uh, this is an example. For recognizable elements for people who come from different backgrounds. So what are some things that could have been done standpoint? Um, could provide a description of what this looks like, uh, but obviously it's intended to be a visual thing. You might think of the audible equivalent as like a battle cry or something like that as you're going into battle, or maybe a song. Um, readability is not always great. So this is a coat of arms from Portugal that's been printed onto some fabric. And it's beautiful to look at, but it's really hard to make out the letters along the bottom there. Um, so not super readable. Some of them are very complex, like this one from Imperial Russia. So if I were to print this into a book, and if I were able to look at all of the details, like with a magnifying glass, then that could be interesting. Uh, but if I put it onto, for example, a coat of arms, I, a lot of this detail would probably get lost. Great, so now let's talk about what lessons we can take away from some of these designs uh, and some of the problems they faced. So a big one is uh, the meaning and unintended meaning behind various symbols. So while I was researching this talk, I read a paper from some students at Kansas State University on the meaning of Chinese symbols on what they mean in non-Chinese cultures. Uh, so one example that they gave that I thought was interesting was a fish, which is a symbol of good luck and joy in China and um, is often used in business logos as a result. But if you were to apply this in a more Western context, a lot of times those are only used in a logo for something that's geared towards children or a restaurant. Uh, so you can see where this could be confusing. If I put a fish into uh, my coat of arms and I wanted it to symbolize good luck, and then someone from a Western background saw it and thought that my house was selling sushi. Um, so even symbols like animals that can seem clear to us often have specific cultural connotations. So the international standard of organizations provide some guidelines on symbols. Uh, you wanna stay away in general from hand gestures, religious symbols, and animals, which can be ambiguous culturally. Um, you can use nature symbols in general, like sun or rain or flowers, graphics that are officially recognized by the ISO, um, and symbols that represent things like equipment or transportation. So something like a truck or a hammer would be pretty safe. Uh, and abstract shapes like circles and squares are also good choices. So I mentioned the International Organization of Standards, and that's a body that was established by the UN and is headquartered in Geneva. 
Their purpose is to develop high quality standards which facilitate exchange of goods, support growth, promote innovation, and protect health, safety, and the environment. Um, so you're probably familiar with some of the icons that they've standardized. They're things that are used in safety contexts or on road signs at airports. Um, they can be things like hospital, a no diving sign. Um, and you can see by looking at these that they're meant to be have a universal meaning. So you don't need to speak a particular language to understand these. Uh, I think another case study when it comes to the meaning of symbols uh, is interesting to look at the kimono from Japan. Um, so I talked about earlier, the blossom is a symbol of the renewal of life. And if I came from somewhere else, I might be able to guess that because plant life is pretty frequently correlated with renewal of life. Um, but it might be harder to understand not having the right background. Um, there are others like this one in the top right is four diamonds, which might be unclear to me at first glance. Um, so some of these symbols are specific to a particular region. Another important lesson that we can take away from heraldic design is the importance of establishing a framework for your user. Um, so as you probably know, we as human beings are really good at recognizing patterns and dealing with patterns. Uh, and you see this in UI design or good UI design uh, with things like a menu, which is pretty consistent between websites. Um, that's very helpful to me if I need to go to a website and find something that the navigation is consistent. Um, and an example of this in heraldic design, a lot of them had a very strict format for a coat of arms. Uh, so this is a more Western one, and it shows a helmet and two supporters and a battle cry or a slogan along the top. Um, so if I studied these and I was very familiar with their anatomy, then I could essentially read this and be able to look at a coat of arms and say, okay, the supporters of this house are this, and this is the motto, and this is where everything goes. Um, it's also good to remember that as sick of you are as a design, your users are not going to be as sick of it. Um, so this is called Jacob's Law of the Internet User. And basically, if you're looking at your own website for maybe one hour or a couple hours every single day, uh, even your most active users are only spending a couple of minutes. Um, so in the course of a month, you can imagine that you would have maybe 30 hours of time spent looking at your website, whereas your user would only have maybe 15 minutes or so. Um, and as a result, you might be sick of the design and think that you need a refresh, but your user doesn't have nearly the same exposure to it. Um, so it's a good thing to keep in mind in design in general. Um, and heavily related, they've done studies that find that users actually like feeling pretty exposed to a website. Um, so you might think that they want a new and edgy experience, um, but in reality, they probably like feeling like they know exactly how your website works. Another important lesson that we can learn from heraldic design uh, is the importance of simplicity. Um, so this is, I think, a good lesson um, from someone named Steve Krug, and he referred to users of the web as sharks, who essentially are going along and trying to accomplish a specific thing, and then they accomplish that and have to keep going. And um, if they stop, then they'll die. They have to keep swimming. So um, if you can imagine your users, when they go to your website, are not trying to like stop and smell the roses. They're trying to accomplish one specific thing, and however you can help them do that will be good. Um, so this is an example of where complexity won out. Uh, this is the 1915 coat of arms for the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and um, there's a lot going on here. Uh, they got into the tradition of passing down history in a coat of arms, and you can see that there are a bunch of flags and crowns and symbols that have been jumbled together here to the point that it's hard to get any meaning from looking at it. Um, so obviously it's very interesting, and if you know what's going on, then I'm sure it tells an interesting story, but um, it might be, have been better to favor simplicity depending on your purpose. Another important lesson that we can take away uh, is com related to complex text flow. Um, so maybe you've had this experience as an engineer where you get your page laid out just right and everything looks awesome. And then you add one word and all of a sudden there's a line break uh, and everything has been changed and it looks horrible. Um, so this is one of the examples of why text flow is really hard to deal with. Um, in particular, if you're changing the language as well, that's an added complication. And in heraldic design, there's a similar corollary um, I have to explain something first. So if I were knight going into battle, um, my right side is called my dexter side and my left side is called my sinister side. 
Um, so on a coat of arms, it looks like this. Uh, the user's right side is their dexter side, and their left side is their sinister. And the sinister side is considered more feminine, and the dexter side was considered more masculine. Um, so the maternal signs would often go on the left. So when houses were initially combined, they would often just split them down the middle and kind of put them together. And I'll show you why that doesn't always work out great. Um, these are two coats of arms, uh, one of which is from Munich and one is from Frankfurt. And if I combine them, it looks like this. Um, so you lose a lot of the original design. Um, so then we get this practice called impalement, which is a form of heraldic combination or marshalling of two coats of arms. That's a little bit more nuanced. Um, so this is an example of a composition of different symbols that I think is more effective. Um, on the left, you see the three blossoms here, which is representing one thing. And then in the middle, you have the two lions, which is another house. And then on the right, you have the bugles and the crosses. Um, so this is an example of how you could combine several symbols in a more thought out approach uh, that ends up being more effective than just kind of chopping them in the middle and sticking them together. Uh, and I think this is heavily correlated to what it's like to deal with text sometimes. Um, so there's not really a clean way to just chop it. Often you have to think very carefully about composing elements. Uh, and the bottom line here is that it's really hard. Often it can feel like this diary page with text everywhere. Uh, and there's no like one size fits all solution. Specialization will be necessary in your approach. So to wrap up, uh, if you take anything away from this talk, uh, try and favor simplicity over complexity. Um, it's a good idea to establish familiar frameworks for your user and consider the meaning that your symbols might have, particularly for people from a different background. Um, so if you take anything away, uh, those are the three things that I would hope that you remember. Uh, and again, I did tweet out these slides. Thank you for coming. And I think we'll have some time for questions.